Now, tonight's sermon is kind of a different sermon. It's a sermon that you will never hear in any other church, probably, in America. Okay, but you're in faith for Baptist Church, and so you're going to hear it tonight. Now, before I preach this sermon, though, I want to make very clear before I get into this, you know, that I believe that we should obey the authorities that are placed over us in our lives. And we talked about this this morning, and tonight's sermon is a little bit of a continuation of this morning's sermon. Because, of course, the 4th of July is coming up on Friday, and so I was preaching about this morning what the Bible says about liberty and freedom. And the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. God's not the God of slavery and bondage and, and one man controlling another man. The Bible says that God has called us to liberty. Okay, And so God is a God that appreciates freedom. Our country has been the freest country in the modern world. Religious freedom. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to bear arms, freedom to assemble. Why? Because the founding fathers said in God we trust. They based the government on the Bible, and so we had freedom as a result, and prosperity, and God's blessings on our country. Now, in Romans chapter 13, we read, and we're reading about people who are living during the Roman Empire, in the book of Romans, okay? And the, book, the Roman Empire had taken over most of the known world. Israel had become a province of the empire. They were being taxed by the Romans. They were being ruled over and governed and garrisoned by the Romans. They did not have freedom. Okay? They were under the control of the Roman Empire. And God is telling us here that we're to obey the authorities in our life. Children are to obey their parents. Uh, you know, we're to obey the laws of the land. We shouldn't go out and break the law and do all this stuff. And so I don't want you to think this morning that I'm teaching, or tonight rather, in this sermon, that I'm teaching anybody to disobey the law, okay, or to fight against the laws that are there. I'm just going to preach to you what the Bible teaches about a certain subject, okay? Now, should we obey the laws? Yes. Should we obey mom and dad if we're little children? Yes. Should we obey the boss at work? Yes. Uh, should we go out and break the laws and defy the government? No. The only time we should defy the government is if the government has a law that contradicts God's law. The Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. Okay. But I'm going to preach tonight on a subject that's not relevant to your personal life. You know, we live in a day where preachers only preach relevant sermons. I'm going to teach to you what the Bible teaches, and it's more of a political theory than anything, but it's straight out of the Bible what the truth about this subject is. Now, before I get into it, you know, we talked about this morning. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. And so, reading Romans 13 was just to balance this sermon out so that you don't think that I'm teaching something about rebelling against authority. Because I'm not. I'm just preaching what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches. Okay. But turn to Genesis chapter 4, and, and let me explain something to you. This morning in the sermon on liberty, I preached about how sin brings the judgment of God, which causes people to be put into bondage and slavery and to lose their freedom as people. Okay? And I also preached about how sin inherently takes away your freedom. I mean, alcohol takes away your freedom. You, you don't choose every day, hmm, am I going to drink today? No, the alcoholic must drink. He must, the, the, the person who's addicted to smoking must smoke. They must take drugs. And so sin will rob you of your freedom. And Jesus said, whosoever, therefore, he said, is, is the, he said you're the servant of sin if you commit sin. And sin has a way of enslaving you, whether it be gambling or drugs or alcohol, uh, the television, pornography. It has a way of controlling your life and ruining your life. But not only that, when God looks down on a nation and he sees a nation that turns away from God, we saw this morning, he brings judgment on that nation in the form of taking away their freedom. Either bringing in an outside army that will oppress them, uh, whether it be the Philistines in the book of Judges or the Midianites, or all these different people, or whether it be people like King Asa who bring internal oppression from the government. That's what we talked about this morning. Now I'm going to show you what God teaches about how a society should operate. And 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 the title of my sermon is this. And and don't judge the sermon until you hear the whole sermon, because you're going to see what the Bible says. So don't listen to the title and say, Oh man, I don't agree with that. Listen to the sermon and then decide whether you agree with it. Because I'm preaching straight out of the Bible. The title of the sermon is this. Why the police should not exist. What? <laughs> Pastor's crazy. 
No, I'm not crazy. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. I'm going to teach you what the Bible says. The title of the sermon, you heard it right. It's why the police should not exist. Now listen to me. We live in a, in a society, and the Bible prophesied that it would be this way in 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The word perilous means dangerous. And I'm going to tell you something. The United States of America is more dangerous right now to live here than it's ever been in the history of this country. I mean, it's a dangerous place. I mean, the murders are on the rise. Thievery is on the rise in Arizona. Identity theft is on the rise. Uh, all this violent crime is on the rise. And I'm telling you, I've experienced it in my own life. I've lived here for two and a half years. We've had bolt cutters found in our front yard. We've had people shaking on our back do door trying to enter our house. We don't live in a bad neighborhood. We live in a, in a decent average neighborhood. We're not rich, you know, but we don't live in a, in a slum. We've had people try to break into our house. We've had people uh, steal my wife's purse and steal her identity, cash checks. I had somebody bust out the windows of my car and steal my laptop case. Thankfully, my laptop is in the house. Steal my laptop case, steal tools. Uh, we live in a day where crime is on a rampage. Uh, I've, I've experienced a hit and run where I've been hit and the people ran. I tried to get the police to do something about it. The police wouldn't do anything about it. I gave them the license plate. They wouldn't even run the plate. They wouldn't even go after it. They said, crime's out of control. We can't keep up with it. We'll run the plate if there's a homicide, they said. But we're not even going to go after it. We live in a day where crime runs rampant. We live in a dangerous time. Now, this has not been the only time where we've lived in a day, where, where mankind's lived in a dangerous society. And don't you know that God has the answer to solve the crime problem in America and in the world? Hey, the Bible has all the answers about everything. And so you better know that God has the answer for the right way. You say, what is it? Is it more police? Is that when we hire more police? Let's have one police officer for every ten people or what? Because there's already, I can't even drive down the road one mile without seeing five police cars. But well, what do we need? More police. It's not solving the problem. We're going to see what the Bible teaches. All right? And so please, just put away your preconceived ideas. Open the Bible with me. And let's read the Bible about how things should be. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse number 8. We're going to start out with the history of violence and a history of the death penalty in the Bible. Let's look at it together. Genesis 4, verse 8, the Bible reads, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. This is the first murder. Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So Cain kills his brother Abel. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee your strength. A fugitive and a bag of mouth shalt thou be in the earth. So what's God's punishment on Cain? He's going to curse the ground. He's going to curse Cain so that nothing he does will prosper. He's going to end up wandering around and being a fugitive and a bag for the rest of his life, right? Look what Cain says in verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from my face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. He's saying, somebody's going to kill me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, and east of Eden. Now, did Cain receive the death penalty for committing murder? No. God did not give the death penalty. He said to God, it's too big of a punishment for me to receive the death penalty. He said, I don't want somebody to kill me for this. He, even though he committed murder, you know, he killed Abel, but he said, I don't want anybody to kill me. And God said, fine. You're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. That's going to be your punishment. Now go down the page and look at verse number 23 of Genesis 4. The Bible says that Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Here's a guy who's got two wives, which is obviously wicked as a devil. Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seven, seventy is sevenfold. He says, well, if Cain could kill somebody, 
and get away with it and not receive them. He said, well, then nobody can kill me either because I actually had a pretty good reason for killing this guy. Okay? Now, look at Genesis chapter 6. Are you getting the progression here? First, Cain kills Abel. He doesn't receive the death penalty. Then Lamech says, well, I'm not going to receive it either. Now look at Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at the result in verse 11. The Bible says, the earth also was corrupt before God. This is Genesis 6, 12. And God looked... I'm sorry, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And of course, God brought the flood on the world. Now, nothing in the Bible is incidental, coincidental, or accidental. Everything in the Bible is exactly the way it should be for a reason. God's teaching us here, Abel kills, or Abel's killed by Cain, Cain gets away with it. Then Lamech says, well, if it's okay for Cain, well, I killed somebody too, and I'm going to get away with it. And then uh, you have the genealogy in chapter 5, and then in the next chapter, you see that hundreds of years have gone by, and the whole world is filled with violence. Do you see that? I mean, violence and filled, filled the world. Now look at Genesis chapter 9. So that's in Genesis chapter 6. The world became so filled with violence where God says, I wish I had never even created the world. And he destroyed the whole world with the flood. Only Noah and his family lived. They got on the ark. They survived. And of course, they're getting off the ark in Genesis chapter 9. God's got a new rule. Look at verse number 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God may he man. That's pretty clear, isn't it? God says that if a person kills another person, they need to be killed for that crime by man. Now, why did God institute the death penalty? Because when there was no death penalty in Genesis 4 with Cain, when there was no death penalty with Lamech in Genesis 4, the whole world became filled with violence. And the whole world became corrupt and evil and dangerous and perilous. And so God said, we're not going to let this happen again, Noah. We need to institute a law that says that if you kill somebody else, you must be killed. Now, God's laws are to protect us. The death penalty is to protect us. If there's no death penalty and murderers are running loose and, and killing and, and, and doing all this, and there's no consequences or a milder consequence, Cain had consequences, but this wasn't enough. Okay, then... Crime runs rampant. Murder runs rampant. Now turn to John chapter 10, if you would. John chapter 10. We're going to look at a lot of Bible tonight. It's kind of like a Bible study tonight. John chapter number 10. And we live in a day where the death penalty is being rejected by society. There are fewer people being executed right now than ever. And yet crime is out of control. There's more murder, more rape, more uh, kidnapping than ever before. Look at John chapter 10, and we're going to see why is, according to the Bible, why is the police failing to protect us? Right? Why are they failing to stop crime? Why is it that the more police we hire, the more crime we have? And they are not doing anything to stop it. Let's see what the Bible says. Look at John chapter 10, verse 11. The Bible reads, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Are you reading this? The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now you see, the problem is, when you hire somebody to protect you, are you listening to this? When you hire somebody to protect you, they see the wolf coming, and you know what they do? They run the other way, because it's not their sheep, it's not their kids, it's not their wife, it's not their family. That's why they're not getting the job done, they're a hireling. Okay, you understand? And, and God's law, I'm going to show you from the Bible, you say, good night, what we do without the police? It would be anarchy. It would be chaos. Well, we're going to see in the Bible, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect 
And yet you will never find the police mentioned in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. They're not there. They're not described. They're not alluded to. They didn't exist. And yet they lived in peace and prosperity. Yet it was not dangerous. Yet in Judges chapter 21, or I'm, I'm sorry, Judges chapter 19, when, when a woman was defiled and abused, do you remember that? By a gang. In Judges chapter 19, and when there was homosexuality, and when a man, uh, remember, mailed out the pieces uh, to the parts of Israel. If you've read the story, you know what I'm talking about. Why is it that they say, hey, there's never been anything like this since the day that God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt until this day in the last uh, 300 years? This has never happened. And yet it happens in America every day. People are being raped in America every day. People are being murdered in America every day. Children are being kidnapped every day. And I'm not to forget nationwide. In Phoenix, Arizona, daily, if you get the Arizona Republic, daily, children are being kidnapped and violated in Phoenix, Arizona on a daily basis. Yet the children of Israel said, this is a shock to us. This is surprising. This has never happened. We never even heard of anything like this. And yet they had no police. How'd they do it? How'd they do it? We have swarms of police, and yet it goes on. Well, let's read the Bible. Let's get the answer. What the hireling cannot accomplish, let's see who can accomplish it. Turn, turn if you would, to Leviticus chapter number 20. This is the third book in your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Right at the beginning of your Bible. And while you're turning there, let me read you another scripture. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. It's a rare, it's a rare thing, isn't it? Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. People aren't just willing to go out and just die for anybody. Right? You know what I mean? Or put their life on the line for just anybody. I mean, maybe for somebody that they love, somebody that's a good man, or somebody, they would be willing to die for Jesus Christ had the ultimate love where he said, I'm willing to die for sinners who, when he hung on the cross, remember Jesus hanging on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The very people who had killed him and put him on the cross as he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen, the first martyr of the New Testament, as he's being stoned to death by the Jews, uh, said, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge as he gave up the ghost in Acts chapter 7. But you see, people aren't just willing to give their life for anybody, are they? No. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. That's what the Bible says. If peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in the world we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But look at Leviticus chapter 20. Let's, let's learn a little more about God's laws and about the death penalty. It's taught throughout the Bible. The Bible reads in Leviticus. You say, I don't agree with that. Then you know what? Go get another Bible. Go get the Quran. Go get the Tao Te Ching. This is the Bible. And the Bible is preached in this church. And read it. And that's what it says. You just got to deal with it. Look at verse number 2. It says, and again, Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Leviticus 20, verse 2, Whosoever ye be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech. It's talking about human sacrifice of your children. Okay. It says shall surely be put to death. Now look at the next words. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Okay, you got that? Underline that in your Bible if you have a pen. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to mark it your Bible. It says, you know, the people of the land shall stone him with stones. Somebody who would murder their own child. And again, remember, I'm not telling us to go out and take the law into our own hands because we do live in a government that's blah, blah, blah. You know, disclaimer. You know, the faith board of church will not be held liable for the actions of people who hear this sermon. But anyway, it says, what does the Bible say is the right method to take care of it, though? Let's just read the Bible, okay? The people of the land shall stone him with stones. If they do what? If they kill their own children? Okay. It says, and I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land... Do in any way hide their eyes from the man when he giveth them a seed in the mullet and kill him not. So whose responsibility? And I'm not saying it's our responsibility today, but whose responsibility was it 
in the nation of Israel when God was in charge to, to execute criminals. The people of the land. Is that what it says or not? Did I make that up? Did I put that in your Bible? No. And the law of the Lord is perfect. So let's keep reading. It says, the people of the land, you know, kill him not, it says in verse 4. Look at verse 5. Then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go whoring after him admit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a whoring after them, that's talking about witchcraft and Satanism, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon them. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife. Boy, this would cut down on all the adultery and wife swapping, wouldn't it? And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife. Even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. The adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lied with his father's wife and uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law. Both of them shall surely put death. I don't know if God's really for the death penalty. I don't know if the Bible really teaches the death penalty. I'm not really sure that God believes in the death penalty. Okay, let's just keep reading it 500 more times. The Bible says, And if a man lies with his daughter-in-law, verse 12, Both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man... Oh, here we go. Now we're cooking with gas. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lied with the woman... Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, he's saying to marry a woman and the woman's mother at the same time, he says, what verse 9? 14. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, and by the way, that's what's next. Mankind lies with mankind today. The queers marched up and down the streets in San Francisco today. They marched in New York City today. They had the annual gay pride parade today on Sunday. The Lord's Day, the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They marched up and down the street with their gay pride. And they marched down the street in California with wedding veils and wedding dresses on. Because it's been legalized in California. And the Bible says that next... It's coming next. After the man lies with mankind, he says, if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death. And he shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. Thou. You see that word? Thou shalt kill the woman and the beast, they shall surely be put to death. And again, I'm not telling you to go out and commit violence. I'm telling you, this is the system that God ordained in the Old Testament. Okay? The power was in the people to execute laws. And we're going to see it further. The Bible says, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Verse number 27, a man also, a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Now turn to chapter number 24. Uh, you're in Leviticus chapter 20. Turn a few pages to chapter 24, verse 13. You say, why are you preaching this? This isn't relevant to my life tomorrow morning. Look, if preachers had been teaching the Bible all along, people would be electing officials that were carrying out God's laws and we would not be living in a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Is an elected official, is some government official going to get this tape and, and restructure the U.S. government? <laughs> but you know what? Somewhere in the world, somewhere in America, somewhere tonight, somebody is preaching what the Bible says that things should be like according to the Bible. You take it and just put it in your computer and do whatever you want with it. But you know what? You're going to walk out tonight knowing the truth about what God says a society should be like. Okay? And so look at verse chapter 24, verse 13. And, and look, I'm not doing... Have you noticed who's doing most of the talking tonight? It's not me. It's him. Because I'm reading a lot of scripture tonight. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that had cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him... Okay, he's talking about somebody cursing God. You know, and, you know I'm not trying to be vile, but be like somebody said, 
blankety blank Jesus Christ. You know, this is this is the rules that God had. You you know, and you know what? People want to have their own religion as long as it's not you know some coercive religion that's trying to take over the world like the Roman Catholic Church. You know, people want to have their own religion, but you know what? God said if somebody curses Jehovah God and the Lord Jesus Christ, God had death penalty for that in the Book of Leviticus. That's what it says. And so He says, let all them that heard Him. Lay their hands upon his head and let all the congregation so. So who's bringing the guy in for committing crime? Who's bringing the guy in that's committed murder? Who's bringing the guy in that's committed rape? Is it the police? I haven't read about the police. Okay, It's saying the people of the land will take upon them to bring people to justice. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at uh, verse number 15. It says, and let, oh yeah, by the way, it says, and let all the congregation stone him. That's the people. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as strangers, he that is born in the land. When he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. And he that killeth any man, is the death penalty for murder, shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth the beast, shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth the beast shall restore it. And he that killeth the man, he shall be put to death. Now, look at Numbers chapter 35. And again, we're just going through a lot of Bible tonight. We're just seeing what the Bible says. Not my opinion. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, you see, and let me just, while you're turning to Numbers 35, let me just explain to you what I'm talking about. The Bible says... The Bible teaches that a, a man, that the citizens in a free society should be allowed to have weapons. That's what the Bible teaches. I'm, I'm a strong believer in the Second Amendment in the United States. Now, the Supreme Court this week, did you hear about it? On Wednesday of this week, the Supreme Court overturned a law in Washington, D.C. that said that people were not allowed to have handguns in Washington, D.C. And, you know, the crime in Washington, D.C. is totally out of control. Have you ever been to Washington, D.C.? I have. The crime there is out of control. Yes. It's a dangerous place. People are scared to death. And, and little old ladies, I mean, their defense is that they've got a handgun, okay? You know, they're not carrying some big rifle. I mean, they've got a handgun in their house just to be protected, just to protect themselves. They want to have a handgun. And it's been outlawed since the 1970s for them to do so. But the Supreme Court said this week, you know, the Constitution of the United States says the right of the people to bear arms should not be infringed. The right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. And they threw out that law. And, you know, thank God that they made that decision. Even, you know, we retain our right to have a weapon. I've got, you know, by the way, I've got a 45. I've got a Ruger 45 handgun. Yes, I do. I've got an M1 assault rifle. Yes, I do. Now, you say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, you don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 23, 13, it says, And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith and turn, shall turn back and cover that which coming from thee. God says, you have a weapon. Of course. And then Jesus, you say, well, what about the New Testament? Jesus Christ said this. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath the purse, let him take it. This is Jesus speaking. And likewise his script, this is Luke twenty-two thirty-six. 36, And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. He said, If you don't have a sword, sell a piece of clothing and buy one. And the disciples said to him, They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. They've got two swords. And he said to them, It's enough. That's why I have two guns. It's enough. God said it's enough. You know, I got my assault rifle, I got my forty five. It's enough. That's what God said. Uh, it's not a sword, but I guess it's like a modern day sword. You know? A handgun. But it's some kind of a weapon. I'm not talking about what weapon. I'm saying God said that people should have a weapon to protect themselves, to protect their family. And the Bible teaches that if a man breaks in on you in the middle of the night, if he's in your house, he says you have the right to kill that man. Because you don't know what's he gonna do to you. Do you wait till he kills you first? And if it's the middle of the night, nobody should be breaking into your house and in your house, right on, up on you. Okay? The Bible says, kill him and be done with him. That's what the Bible says. And if somebody breaks into my house tonight and comes in there, I'm going to pull out my 45 and blow their head off. And I won't even think twice about it because that's what the Bible says to do. Okay? 
And they're all singing him while the police are on their way over to pick up the body. Okay? Now, look at Numbers 35, verse 16. Is that where I had to turn? Yes. Numbers 35, 16, the Bible says, and you go ahead and think I'm crazy. This is what the Bible says. I think you're crazy if you think that the way our society operates is normal, because it's not. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in verse 16, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Verse 17, And if he smite him with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand a weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he's a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. I don't know. Do you think God believes the death penalty for murder? I'm not sure. I'm still trying to figure it out. But watch this. It says, verse 19, The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. Okay? But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by lying of weight that he die, or an enemy smite with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. That's what the Bible says. Okay? Now, in Romans 13, where we started, the Bible says the powers of be, we must obey them, they're ordained of God. We can't fight against the government, we shouldn't fight against the power and, and fight against authority. But the Bible said of the government that we have, it said, But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him to do thee. So today we do have a revenger. We have the police. Okay? But is it the revenger that God ordained in the Old Testament? No. And I, I have in my notes to read all this, but look at verse 24, and I'm going to explain a little more about the sermon. Look at verse 24. The Bible says, Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. Now, here's the thing. We have three branches of government, and this is a, a lesson in the Bible. The Bible teaches to have uh, uh, branches of government. Three branches of government. Number one is the legislative branch. That's the branch that makes laws for our country. That's the Congress of the United States, right? They make our laws. Then we have the judicial branch. The judicial branch interprets the law. Okay, they determine guilt, right? People go to court, there's a judge, there's a jury, and that judicial system decides whether a person is guilty or innocent, right? Then we have what's called the executive branch. The executive branch is the one who executes the law, enforces the law, carries out the law, right? Now, in the Bible, they had legislators. They had lawmakers. They had elected officials, representative government, ordained in Deuteronomy chapter 1, where God explains to make rulers and to choose from among them men of integrity and honesty that hate covetousness and and, you know, put them in charge and they can make laws for you, okay? And then, of course, there's God's laws, there's the supreme law of the land. Like their constitution was the law of God, okay? Then you have judges in the Bible. There's a whole book in the Bible called the Book of Judges. And these judges would decide who is guilty and who is not guilty. And then they even had juries. Because the congregation would come to it, and people would decide and make the decision whether a person was guilty or innocent, whether a person had committed murder or if it was just an accident. The Bible talks about, for example, a man is, is chopping wood, and you know the axe handle flies off, hits somebody in the head. The guy was an accident. He's not a murderer, right? And so you got to have a legal system. you got to have judges to determine who is guilty, who is innocent. The Bible talks about a person being found dead in the field. And people come upon him, they find this dead body in the field. He said they're going to make, the judges and the elders are going to make diligent inquiry to figure out who killed this person. Okay? So we're talking about investigation, judgment, to determine the guilt of somebody or the innocence. Right? The Bible teaches this. Laws. I'm not preaching anarchy. Laws. We need laws. God gives us many laws. He gives us punishments that are fitting to that crime. But who is the executive branch in the Bible? Who is the one who lays hands on them and brings them in and says, this person has committed this crime, this person is a rapist, this person is an adulterer, this person is a murderer, and they bring them in, the people, when they find them. And they bring them in, 
and they get the Carisia, they determine guilt or innocence, and they stone him with stone. If somebody just clear cut, blatantly murders a man, there's no question about it whether he did it. The Bible says that the revenger of blood, as soon as he finds him, as soon as he meets him, kill him immediately. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, then the Bible talks about, you know, the judges determining. If, the, if somebody killed somebody wrongfully, the judge will determine that and take care of it. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about tonight? Okay, but the power lies in the people to protect themselves. We live in a society where people don't protect themselves. People don't have weapons to protect themselves. And people rely on the police to protect them. The problem is the police is a hireling. You say, well, what's the answer for crime? Well, number one, the answer is that we reinstitute the death penalty in the United States of America. Every murderer, according to the Bible, should be put to death. Right. That'll control crime. I don't think it's going to work. It worked back then. God said it would work. If it doesn't work, then God's a liar. The Bible says because judgment is not executed speedily against wickedness. He said there, that's why it's so wicked, because it doesn't happen speedily. People get uh, convicted of murder, they don't die for 20 years. But the Bible teaches that they should be speedily put to death. In fact, right as soon as they meet him. That's pretty fast. That's a fast death penalty. Okay? And so here we see, how do we control crime? How could we have a safer society? Number one, reinstitute the death penalty in America. Number two, institute the death penalty in America for what God said determined deserves the death penalty, not just murder. Now, it has been 44 years, you know, I got the news articles from this week. This is just from one week. It has been 44 years in America since anyone has been put to death for anything other than murder. It's been 44 years. Now, the Supreme Court this week, in a 5-4 to four decision, on Wednesday, the same day that they said we could have guns, thank God, in the same day, in a 5-4 to four decision, they outlawed executing people convicted of raping a child. Did you hear that? I mean, the Supreme Court today said it is illegal for any state, any city, any municipality to put someone to death for raping a child. They said that does not deserve the death penalty. What did God say? You better know it does. And I'll be honest with you, I'd rather have somebody kill my child than to rape my child. And I, I, I wouldn't want either of those things to happen. But you know, raping someone is a, is a severe, serious offense. Raping a little child? Can you think of anything more wicked? I mean, can you think of anything more twisted, more perverted? I mean, I can think of reasons why one person might kill another. I mean, I can think of a crime of passion, and it's still wrong. I mean, when Moses committed murder, it was wrong. But you know what? He committed murder because one of his brethren was being oppressed and beaten, and he committed murder, and it was wrong. But I'm going to tell you something. What's the justification for a man who would rape a little child? It's as wicked as the devil. It's the most wicked, abominable thing imaginable. And the Supreme Court says it's not worthy of the death penalty. That's excessive punishment. This is what Kennedy... Justice Kennedy. He shouldn't be called, he should be called Injustice Kennedy. This is what he said. There is a national consensus against capital punishment for the crime of child rape. We all agree, right? That's what he said. It's funny because four of the people on the Supreme Court didn't even agree. But there's just this consensus nationwide. That everybody just agrees that that's way too much punishment for somebody who rapes them. You know what? If somebody rapes my child, I'm going to execute the death penalty myself. I promise you that. You mark it down, brother. But this is the day we're living. This is why it's so dangerous out there. This is why if I were you, I wouldn't let my kids out of my sight. It happens every day. I can name people in my extended family that have been affected by this kind of stuff, that have been molested, that have been defiled. You could too. You know about your friends and loved ones that this kind of stuff has happened to. And why? They won't punish them. It's a revolving door down at the, at the, at the jailhouse. They let them out after two years, five years, four years to go do it again. The system's not working, my friend. Are we going to change the system? No. But we're going to walk out of here and understand what the system should be because we know the Bible. Say, why preach it? Because I'm preaching the truth. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Because maybe you won't go out and vote for these bunch of uh, big government commies that are ruining our country. But, let's...
let's get back into the Bible. Let's keep going with this. Let's, let's look at even more scriptures. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 13. Deuteronomy 13 is the fifth book in the Bible, right towards the beginning of your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 13. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 13, 6, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one of the earth, even to the other. And you know, these gods were wicked. I mean, Baal and Molech and Ashtar, they involve human sacrifices. I mean, they involve dirty things. I mean, horrible, wicked things. He says, thou. And of course, we know the word thou is singular. That's why the Bible uses the words you and thou both. Because thou is singular, you is plural. And he says, thou shalt not consent unto them in verse 8, nor hearken unto him, neither shalt thou not pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thy hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people... And thou shalt stone him with stones that he died, because he had sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and they might not do any more such wickedness as this among you. No, it says they'll hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. Look at verse 17. I'm sorry, chapter 17. Look at Deuteronomy 17, chapter 17, verse 2. If there be found among you, Within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God, and transgressed his heaven, and gone and served other gods, which and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing be and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel, then thou, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman. Which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shall stone them with stones till they die. At the mouth of two witnesses, see, nobody should be killed, the Bible says, unless there's two or three witnesses. Okay? So don't get me wrong, right. it's not just a killing spree. Okay? It says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness shall he not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses, are you listening to this? Shall be first upon him. So who's the one who brings him in? Who's the one who throws the cuffs on him and brings him in? The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterward the hands of all the people. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. And if there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gates, then, thou, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come to the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge, right, if it's, if it's questionable, that shall be in those days and inquire, and he shall show thee the sentence of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence. Who, who executes the sentence? You see this? Uh, thou shalt do according to the sentence, which they in that place, which the Lord shall choose, shall show thee, and thou shalt observe to do according to all they inform thee. And I have so many more scriptures. I mean, can I, I'm just going to give you the references on some of these because I don't want to just go on and on here, okay? But Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 23, he says the same thing. It says that it talks about the citizens taking hold on somebody and bringing them in for the crime. Exodus 21, 12 through 19. Deuteronomy 22, 18 through uh, verse 30. And uh, those are three other long, lengthy passages that explain the same truth that I'm preaching to you right now. You see, here's, the, here's, here's what we live with, though. This is what we've got. Listen to this. Scottsdale officers hitting the streets. You see, now we have police being added in Scottsdale, not just driving up and down our streets every day, patrolling us and watching us and policing us. Now we have them walking up and down the streets from house to house, policing in the city of Scottsdale. It says, uh, this girl, here's an example. This girl's mother had taken her son to school and left her daughter alone in the apartment with the door unlocked. This is, a, this is not a child, though. This is a, an adult. Okay. The family is being, or a teenager or whatever. Family being supervised by Child Protective Services. McDonald, this officer, also knocks on doors, warning residents that their garage door is open or that tools tossed in a truck bed are bait for burglars. 
Madonna, uh, Lori Stegall, 53, was surprised Madonna roused her because her front door was open behind a locked screen door, a possible sign of trouble. In the middle of the night, they wake up this woman in the middle of the night and say, I know your screen door is locked, but your door is not locked. Your garage door is open. Now listen, maybe you want half of your money to be taken out of your paycheck. I don't know, maybe you'd like to give all your money to the government so that the government can be your babysitter and police you and walk up and down the street and make sure that your doors, both doors are shut, not just one of the doors, and to walk up and down your street every day watching you. Hey, in a free society, you don't have a police state. Are you listening? With police walking up and down the street, driving up and down the road, watching you, making sure that you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. That's not freedom. Did you know in the United States, it didn't used to be that way? Have you ever heard this term, the county sheriff? Has anybody ever heard that before? You know how big a county is? Yet they had a county sheriff. One man. They didn't have thousands going up and down the streets. Cameras on all the street corners. I was in Chicago, Illinois this week. You listen to me, and you listen good. I preached it this morning that when a nation forgets God, when a nation turns away from their God, when a nation does evil in the sight of the Lord, they lose freedom. That's what the Bible says. I was in Chicago, Illinois this week. I was ironically driving down Independence Boulevard. Do you know the street, Brother Dave? <laughs> Independence Boulevard. If you want to buy drugs in Chicago, just get off at Independence Boulevard. Okay, so here's Independence Boulevard, ironically in the name. And I wanted to take a picture, but I didn't have my camera. But right next to the street sign that said Independence Boulevard, there was a metal box like this on the light pole with a black dome with a 360-degree pan-tilt-zoom camera. You say, how do you know about this? Because I'm in the electronics business. I know about this. It's a camera that they can control like a joystick. They can zoom in on the head of a penny. And this camera is at the intersection. And it had the police logo on the side of the camera. It said Chicago Police Department. And they are watching that street with a, uh, a video lens. And they have a joystick. And they're watching what's going on all the time in the streets. In Great Britain today, and of course we're celebrating our independence this Friday, I wish people knew what that meant anymore. I wish people understood what this country was built on anymore, and understood that this country is built on freedom and liberty, and that July 4th is not just a day to blow off fireworks and eat a hot dog and a piece of cake, hey, but to understand that we live in the freest country that's ever existed on the face of the earth, where we have freedom. Well, outside of Israel and the Bible, the second freest. But I'm going to tell you something. You think that the founding fathers of our country, you think that God has ordained this police state that we live in where the government is watching us on camera? Great Britain is who we got our independence from. And you know what? In Great Britain today, go to any city in Great Britain. Go to Manchester. Go to London. Go to any of these big cities. Every square inch of that city is on closed circuit television. Did you know that? Probably didn't know that, did you? I, I talked to my boss, my boss from Ireland, he said, oh yeah, closed circuit television everywhere. You walk down the street, Big Brother is watching you in England today. Why? Because the crime got so out of control that the police could not control it anymore, and they said, we just have to put the whole cities on camera, every city is on camera. I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk down the street and have cameras watching me all the time. That sounds like oppression. That sounds like sleep. That sounds like bondage. And that's what our country is going to because of sin. Sin always brings bondage. It brought the children of Israel into bondage. Again and again in the Bible. Big Brother watching you. Cameras everywhere in the United States of America. Walking down the street. Smile, you're on candy camera. In Tempe, Arizona. Smile, you're on candy camera. It's, a, it's in Tempe. They're building cameras all over the... Hey, you, you say, where are those are just red light violation cameras? Oh yeah? We just saw another one. We drove down the road. It was a trailer. It has a trailer hitch that hooks up to the back of a vehicle, and the police drops that off at different places, and it has closer to It's not an intersection, nothing to do with speeding, nothing to do with the red light, there's no radar. It has nine cameras looking all different directions, and it says mobile police surveillance unit, and they're dropped off all over the city of Tempe. I can, we can drive around at church, I can show you. And then, when we're done with that, I can drive you down to the Tempe Public Library after the service, and I can show you a tank. A tank that will say on the side of it. I'm talking about a tank. I mean, does everybody know what a tank is? You know, it's got those big wheels with the things on it, and it's got the big cannon and the armor. You know what it says on the side of it? Tempe Police Department. To the Tempe Library. My wife goes there every week. 
There it is. A tank. <laughs> now, who's ever heard this word, garrison? Just put a brand you know that word. Don't be ashamed if you don't know it. It's not a word that's used around. Who knows what a garrison is? Who thinks you know what it is, a garrison? I'm not going to ask you to tell me, but who thinks you know what it is? A garrison is an army that's stationed among people to control it. Okay, this is the Bible. Taught, the Bible uses this word a lot. When the Philistines took over the nation of Israel, they put garrisons in Israel. That means they had troops occupying that city, patrolling them, making sure that they were able to extort money from them, which is what the Philistines were doing: extorting grain, extorting money, taking away their freedom, controlling them. These garrisons were a result of God's judgment. They're standing troops and armies. There was a, now, what's the difference between some army, okay, controlling and oppressing you, and, and a police department that's got a tank and machine guns, and they drive up and down the road, and they have cameras and checkpoints and all this stuff? Hey, it's not of God. It's not found in God's laws. It's not making us any safer because we're just as dangerous as it was yesterday. In fact, it's more dangerous. And tomorrow, it's going to be even more dangerous. The statistics don't lie. The facts don't lie. Look, I've lived here for two and a half years. Look at the crimes that I've been facing. You know, that's just two and a half years in a decent neighborhood. But Scottsdale officers are hitting the street to walk up and down the street, making sure everybody's door is locked and the garage doors are open. And, but what I want to know is who's going to protect us from them? You know what I mean? Listen to this. I'm not even going to read this. This is too... It's too bad. I don't even want to talk about some of this stuff. It's so bad. But, listen to this. A Lakeville man says he feels violated after two police officers woke him up at 3 a.m. to tell him his door was unlocked. <laughs> okay? <laughs> their surprise visit was part of a public service campaign to remind residents to secure their homes to prevent that. And keep in mind, we're paying for these people. The Bible says that when the children of Israel... Uh, or I'm sorry, when the Egyptians sold themselves into bondage to Pharaoh, they were taxed at 20%, which is much less than what we pay. Where do you think all that money? We've got to pay for all this, for these police to, to patrol us. And, and we don't need them. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not done with the sermon. Buckle your seatbelts. I'm going to tell you why we don't need them. Why, why we're spending just thousands of dollars out of our own money to the Tempe police. I mean, if you live in Tempe, you live in Phoenix, you're paying these people. You're being taxed heavily to pay for these people to protect you. Yet they're not protecting you. I don't rely on them for protection. I rely on my two swords. But the Bible says here, but they went further. So this guy felt a little violated when they woke up at 3 a.m. to tell him the door was unlocked. How would you like to be woken up? That'd be a little scary, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sir, the door's unlocked. What are you doing? I didn't invite you in here. And I'm sure they knocked on the door. I'm just kidding. But anyway, it says, but they went further in Troy Moult's case on Thursday. Police entered the house where four children under seven were having a sleepover and then went upstairs to Moult's bedroom. Okay, so this one, they went into the house. Oh, your door's unlocked. Oh, let's go upstairs into a bedroom with four children that are under seven. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. The police are God men. They never do anything wrong. We should just trust them. Let's just give all them the weapons. Let's give all the weapons to the police force and let's turn in all our weapons for a hundred dollar gift card. I got so much material in this room, I don't know what to do with it. We can turn it in for a hundred dollar gift card for bashes. We can turn in our guns to the police. That's what he did. They'll give you a hundred dollar gift card to bashes if you give them your weapon. I'm not giving my weapon. I'm going to be, you know. <laughs> right. I don't even shop at bashes. I shop at Fry's Foods. Okay? I don't need a hundred dollar gift card to bashes to turn in my sword. But they went into the they went into Troy Mould's house. They went upstairs where four children under seven were having a sleepover. They went upstairs to Mould's bedroom. The officers told Mould his garage door was open. The TV was on. The keys to his truck were left in the ignition and the door to his house was ajar. Well, yeah, the house was filled with people. A police spokesman said the intrusion was justified because the officers' initial door knocks went unanswered and they wanted to make sure nothing was yeah, nothing was wrong until you got here and walked in on us. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen to this stuff. We're paying these people. Police chief won't... Uh, won't what does it say? Officer Chong Kim resigned on Wednesday. This is in Scottsdale. 
in the wake of a police investigation into a possible inappropriate search of a 19-year-old woman. The mother of the 19-year-old woman sent an email to police saying that when a call about a possible break-in, an officer inappropriately searched her daughter. An investigation into a similar allegation against Kim by different women in September was inconclusive. We're not really sure, but we keep getting all these reports about this same police officer, Chong Kim, who just, he'll be called out because they thought somebody's breaking in, and then he wants to pat down young women. It's, we don't really know what to make of it. It's inconclusive, you know. This guy, his, the mom calls and I think somebody's breaking in, and he says, well, you know, I'm going to need to search her, your daughter, this 19-year-old girl. Can't really figure out why. Now, let me just break this to you. Police are human beings. They're sinners, like I say, like yours. Number two, they're hirelings. They don't care about it. It's not their sheep. It's not, their, it's not their family. Did you know this? Did you know that if you, and, and you know, if people aren't going to like this, I'm, so, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but you know what? Did you know that if you take a test to join the police department, did you know that if you score too high on that test, you cannot be a police officer? <laughs> That's true. Who, who, who can verify that what I'm saying is true right now? Yeah. You, it's true. I mean, if you, you, they take a test, and they want you to score high enough so that you're not just a numbskull. But if you score too high, they're like, sorry, you can't be a police officer. Because they can't control you enough, or I don't know what. So the people with the badge on are not always going to be the sharpest tool in the shed. And they're not always going to be the most righteous, as in the case of our friend Sean Kim. Okay, now I'm not saying all police officers are bad. Don't, don't, you know, say that I said things that I didn't say. I didn't say all police officers are bad. I said they're a higher way. I said they're ineffective. I said they cost too much money. I said they're worthless. That's what I said. Now listen, let's, let's, let's bring it. You say, Pastor Anderson, what's the answer? This is the answer. You say, uh, okay, do you know what cops spend their time at? I've talked to so many people that have done a ride along with the police on an overnight shift. Did you know that my uncle is a sheriff's deputy? Did you know that my grandfather's a famous police lieutenant? I mean, people know him in Los Angeles. In fact, there's a movie character that was based on my grandfather, okay? And so he's very well known. If I say his name, you'd laugh. If I say his name, you'd still know the name, okay? And so his, his last name is Tackleberry, but people pronounce it Tackleberry, okay? And, you know, you might have seen the movie, okay, literally. And, and there's all, we have all kinds of newspaper articles about him and everything, and he was well known in, in LAPD, literally. That, you know, I know about the police, okay? And, and I've talked to people recently that have done ride-alongs, and you know what police are, are busy doing? You know, giving tickets, right? Harassing you, okay? Number two, they're busy with domestic disputes. That's like what they do. That's what they do. I mean, talk to police, any police officer you know, talk to police officers, talk to people who've done ride-alongs, they're dealing with domestic disputes, okay? When I was a teenager, I don't watch TV anymore. When I was a teenager, we used to watch the show Cops. You know what I mean? Everybody's face is blurred out. Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> All it is is domestic disputes. That's like what 90% of the show is. Okay? Now, listen. You say, well, we got to have the police. Look, do you want to pay somebody, how much are they making? 70000 a year in Phoenix, the police officers? You want to pay somebody $70,000 a year to go mediate some argument between a couple people in the ghetto? Who are getting mad at fight. Now you say, well, what should we do? We can't just have violence. You're right. We shouldn't have violence. Here, here's the answer to the problem. You got some guy in an apartment complex beating up his pregnant wife or pregnant girlfriend. We have a problem here, right? What do people do in 2008 when that happens? They pick up their phone and they call the police. And the police comes and says, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> or they arrest them and turn them loose three hours later after they fingerprint them and take their DNA sample. Okay, well here's what you do in Bible society. And you know, I'm not recommending you do this. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not saying you should do it. The powers that be are ordained of God. But what did they do back in Bible times? I'd say, hey, man, this guy's beating up his uh, pregnant girlfriend next door. He's beating up his pregnant wife. Let's go beat the fire out of him ourselves. <laughs> and the funny thing is, that would actually solve the problem. Because he's not going to do it again. Because then he's going to face me and my buddies again. Beating and, and you know, we might even bring a baseball bat. We might even bring a lead pipe. Okay? And we'll take care of the problem. But the police aren't going to take care of the problem. The police are going to give him a little drive around town and take his fingerprints and, and send him on a bench and let him go. 
Look, it doesn't work, man. You say, oh, if we didn't have the police, we have anarchy. Oh, we got to have the police. Oh, we got to have welfare. Oh, we got to have social services. Oh, we got to have social security. Oh, we got to have this. We got to have that. Look, this big government is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bible. All you need is God and a man who works hard, pays his own bills, pays for his own family, and protects his own house and his own neighborhood. You see, when something is not our responsibility, we say, I'm not going to stop the crime on my street. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. If somebody was on my street beating up a pregnant woman, you know what I'd do? I'd call the police. Because I don't have the authority to go down there and take care of it. I, I didn't, I didn't, if I wouldn't beat the guy up, they'd put me in jail, right? So what do I do? I call the police. Somebody hits me in a hit and run. I was chasing them myself. I saw a motorcycle cop. This really happened about six months ago. I got rear-ended, hit and run. I'm chasing the guy. You know, and we were in rush hour traffic, so we're only going like 25, 30, but I'm staying right with the guy. I see a motorcycle cop off to the side of the road. I said, yes, this guy is here to protect and to serve. This guy will protect me. This guy will solve the problem. What did I do? I pull off the road, I jumped out of my car, and I said, right there, that white Monte Carlo, license plate number, blah, 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 blah. I spat it out to him. I said, go get him. He just hit me. Look at my car. And the guy said, okay, I'll get him. He hopped on his motorcycle. I mean, we can see the guy. Cars are going 25 miles an hour. He's on a motorcycle. He can go between the cars. He said, I lost him. <laughs> and I said, well, run that plate. Can you run that plate? No, maybe it's a homicide or something. I said, fill out a police report. He's like, no, I don't. He's like, I don't think the rental car company's going to charge you. The damage is minor. I said, look, the rental car company will charge me. They tried to sell me like uh, $50 a day worth of insurance on my way out. Okay, they're going to say, no, you will pay this. And he's like, I think this will wipe off. It was, a, I mean, it was a couch. In the, I mean, it was bad. The, dent, the bumper had like really shoved up onto the car. He's like, my wife off. I said, is this going to pick off? You know? I said, if you would have caught the guy, what would you have done? He said, well, that's not much we can do. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> but see, if there were no police, see, we're just kind of, do you mind if we just go into a little fantasy tonight? What if there were no police? <laughs> if there were no police, I would have chased the guy. I would have caught the guy. I would have taken the guy to the judges, and I would have got the money for the damage to my car. And if I needed some help, I would have just got a few of my buddies together and we would have gone and take care of it. Okay? And see, the police don't protect us. They're hirelings. They don't care. It wasn't his car. He didn't care. We call the police. We have burglars breaking our house. We call the police. They show up 20 minutes later when they know it's safe. <laughs> and don't tell me they were far away because they hang out. I know where they hang out. They hang out at the Chevron station right here. And they're all pulled up, you know, they pull up their cars are facing each other, so they can put their driver windows right next to each other, and they're talking and drinking coffee and hanging out all night at 48th Street and Broadway at the Chevron. <laughs> That's only, what, two minutes from my house? You know, the response time could be fast. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not really trying to be funny tonight. I mean, I'm preaching the Bible tonight. This is what the Bible says. What's the moral of the story? What does all this mean? <laughs> hey, this is what it means. It means that if our society continues on the wicked downward spiral that it's on, mm -hmm. we are headed for a police state in this country. Mm -hmm. It's happened before, it'll happen again. I mean, they're tapping our phone lines. It went through Congress weeks ago, you know. The, the, you know uh, and you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a conservative, you know, but I guess I'm a libertarian almost in some ways more than I'm a conservative. But you know what? I'm a conservative, but you know what? The, the conservatives just want to tap our phone lines and, and, and uh, check our emails. Mm -hmm. And you know, the liberals want to, you know, they want, they want to take away our freedoms in other areas. They want to take all our money away. You know? And I'm going to tell you something. The answer is not even a political answer. The problem is that when you spit in the eye of God, and when you do evil in the sight of the Lord and turn away from God's laws, your nation will, will go into bondage and go to sin. You can't have liberty without the Spirit of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And where the Spirit of the Lord is not, go to the nation that rejects Christianity, there's no liberty. There's no liberty today in communist China where Christianity is illegal. Where it's against the law to have more than one child. There's no liberty with the United Nations who forces sterilizations around the world. 
who forces people to be sterilized against their will in third world countries? There's no freedom with the United States. There's no freedom with communist China. And you know what the only answer for America, out of the situation we're in, the police state that's coming, that the, the big brother is watching you that's coming, where all of our freedoms are going to be taken away, and we're going to decide, well, I guess it's time to dissolve the bands that have tied us to this government like they did in 1776. We're not going to be able to, because there's going to be a policeman waiting outside our door and a camera pointed at our front door. And so what's the answer? We've got to cleanse the wickedness out of our lives in this country. You can't live in sin and, and wickedness and expect to live free. You've got to choose. Now look, you've got to choose in your personal life. Do you want to be free or do you want to live a wicked and ungodly life? And then our nation's going to have to decide, do we want to be free in America or do we want to have eat, drink, and be merry and free love and free dope and, and, and alcohol and wickedness? We've got to decide between those two. Porno or freedom? Sin, freedom. In your personal life? Yes. In your, uh, as a nation's life? Yes. I don't know about you. I like what Patrick Henry said. Give me liberty or give me death. Live free or die. Hey, I don't want to be a slave in my life. And I don't think you want to be a slave. And I don't want America to go to slavery. Let's knock these doors. Let's preach the gospel. Let's stay on root ties and cry out against sin. And turn this nation back to God. It's the only answer. Let's bow our hands and have a word of prayer. Father.